crashing stock markets cannot get to them. In the inner chamber of heaven, it's a matter of investment. And, and that ought to bring you joy. That ought to bring you joy. Men by nature love not as much as women. Men are hunters. Women are gatherers. But men too like to collect things. Like to know they're storing things up. Jesus plays off of that. You ought to be thinking about what am I storing up? And that carrying more and more of your heart as time goes by. I've heard old saints say, as the years have gone by, more and more of my heart has gone to heaven. And what they're referring to, of course, is their loved ones, their dear Christian brothers and sisters in Christ that have passed away, that more and more of, of all their joy is being sent on to glory. I like that. I like that. Except it should refer to more than relationships. It should refer to everything that we are. Everything. Now, Let's look at this passage. It says, as a result of the anguish of his soul. I've written here, the Messiah's work would be marked by the intense suffering of bearing his people's iniquity and the wrath of God. You know when it says that God made our sin to fall upon him? That doesn't mean like uh, when you're sitting in a tree stand and there's no wind and it begins to snow and you see the snowflakes just literally. It seems like they take for an hour fall to the ground. The word that's used there by the, our sins, God making our sins to fall upon Him is a violent, crushing, attacking, storming type of, fell upon Him like a cougar would fall upon a white tail. Like a, like a group of bandits would fall upon an unarmed man. Literally crushing like a safe falling out of a 30 story skyscraper on your head. Hit him all at once. The word anguish comes from the uh, Hebrew word which denotes wearisome labor, toil, trouble, and travail. Now, just by way of passing here, please do not think that the sufferings of G our Lord Jesus Christ begin at his betrayal, his trial, and the cross. That's where they culminated. He suffered the day he was born on this planet. Although he himself, there was nothing fallen in his nature. He experienced the miseries and the infirmities of this life. He suffered and in a sense was a man of sorrows from the very beginning. It's very important. The old saints used to talk about that a lot more than we talk about it today. Imagine stepping down from the throne of glory, infinite pleasure, in the fullness of the presence of God, to come to this earth in a body of flesh. And don't think like I, I've, I've, a lot of pop novels, Christian novels, seem to pretend that when Jesus walked on this planet, he walked on this planet sort of like, and the charismatics are really big at this, kind of like Adam before the fall. Perfect body, superhuman. You know, Jesus, man, he was just... He did not walk on this earth in a body like Adam's before the fall. He walked on this earth with a body subject to the weaknesses, infirmities, pains, toil, anguish that we all experience. He was like us in every way, yet without sin. It's very important. That, that means a lot to me. I don't, I don't know about you, but it means a lot to me. It means I have a great high priest that isn't a delusion. He isn't someone biting his lip on television saying, I know your pain. He really knows your pain. Now, so there was the idea of wearisome toil and labor and trouble and travail. Anyone will tell you guys to fight anybody for three seconds or even one round is not that difficult to task. 
To fight them for years is quite another thing. To deal with a pain, momentary, no matter how deep and horrid that pain will be, it cannot compare with the dreary pain that comes daily, every moment, unrelenting, no rest from it. Albert Barnes writes that the word refers to an, the arduous and, and wearisome labor and trial involved in the work of redemption as that which exhausted the powers of the Messiah as a man and sunk him down to the grave. This Jesus gave up a lot more than what we understand. Especially if we think that his life was pretty much wonderful until he was betrayed. No. Have you ever had a group of men hate you? When you walk in a room, you know every one of them hates you. Do you know how hard that is? Then think about Christ. Do you realize that, have you ever seen a person, I mean, this happened in my school. Maybe you went to a better school than, than me. I, I guess I, I didn't go to that great school. But, I mean, anybody who did their studies in my school would get beat up. I mean, if you did your studies, if you were nice to the teacher, if you were a, just an all-around good guy in class, man, you got picked on bad. Bad. Now, imagine, imagine even Jesus as a child and a young man. If, if, if we being evil, when we attempt to live a righteous life, it causes other people to hate us. Have you noticed that? A guy working at a factory, a Christian working at a factory. He goes to have lunch during lunch break with everybody else. He, does, he goes over by himself. He opens up his lunch bucket. He pulls out a sandwich. He sits it before him. And right before he eats, he bows his head to pray. That's all he does, silently, in a corner. Other men working at the factory see him and, and nail him. One of the things that's a problem with preachers today is we don't live in the real world. You go to that factory, you go watch, have to live the life of some Christians who are right in the middle of ungodly people. All they have to do is do one tiny act of piety that they're not trying to display and have everybody mad at them. Now imagine the perfect Christ walking on this planet. How much it must have got like a, like a, you know, a thorn under the saddle of most people. I mean, there's so much that we don't know. But I can tell you this, he was a man of sorrow. A man who suffered long. Have you ever felt like you couldn't sense anything of the presence of God and it made you feel horrible? You and I who know nothing of the presence of God, and yet the little that we do know, when it's not there, it scares us to death. Now imagine spending eternity in the fullness of the presence of God and then being coming to earth, an intermittent sense of God's presence. I mean, it just goes on, guys. This is why you need to sit in your study. Think about these things. Communicate these things. We've reduced the whole package down to Jesus died for you, and that's it. Instead of laboring to explain what that means. Now, says he will see it. This is a powerful statement. The Messiah's work would not be in vain. He would see it through to its end. He would accomplish it and rejoice, even revel in its reward. The justification of many. He, he saw it. He knew this is going to be my reward. And that, that, that drove him, that certainty that it was going to be done. He saw it through and he knew he would see it. Make it through what he had to make through. He knew in the end he would see the pleasure of it. Now, what difference is there between you and that? Even in all our failings, in all our weaknesses, has not God promised us the same thing? See it through. Not with some...